Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Give the Lord all the praise right now. How many of you are so grateful for your salvation? He set you free to set others free. And he says, go make disciples of all nations. And that's what we're talking about this month. It's about discipleship. You never stop being a disciple. Tell the person next to you, you are a disciple, I hope. <laughs> okay, we win souls, but the discipleship process begins. And so as your senior pastor, my job is to disciple the leaders, then in turn they disciple you, and it continues to multiply together to build the body of Christ. Can I hear an amen? So I want you to turn your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. So those, there's people in this room that are either are Paul or Timothy, or you are both. I consider myself both. I'm a Timothy to my father, which is Pastor Sonny Sr. He's my Paul. And then I'm a Paul to many of you. And you're my Timothys. So I impart to you as you impart to others. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. It says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses. Commit these to faithful men, say faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I pray you help me. Use me, God, for your glory and honor. Anoint my lips. Anoint everything I say. Anoint every listener in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. We need a few good men. Tell the person next to you, and women too. Go ahead and be seated. The Bible says many are called, but what? Why, why so, so many people are called, but only few are chosen? Why? Because it's selection. God wants us to select people that we could disciple that will be open and teachable. Open to receive, open to be changed, open to be molded and shaped. So some people are missing the call of God because they're not in that posture. They're not in that mode. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to review a little bit of what I did last time. How many of you remember my message two weeks ago? Like five of you. Okay, great. My God. All this work I do. <laughs> and no one remembers what we do. Do you remember what Philip spoke on last week? <laughs> Anyone know? Okay. You guys take notes. Come on now. And then we have, a, we have podcasts, we have all these opportunities for you to re review and see it again. So I've been taking my time on this message. I could have spoken in one, one day, that last two weeks ago when he had communion. But I want to take my time because I believe sometimes we hear it and we, 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 we don't remember. It doesn't really get into us. So it's important for you to digest the word. Can I hear an amen from somebody? So in this context of Timothy, 2 Timothy, this is written to Timothy by Paul, his spiritual son in the faith, at a time where Timothy was pastoring one of the largest churches of that time. He was a young pastor. Kind of reminds me of me when I took over this church at 29 years old. A long time ago now. Feels like just time flies, doesn't it, Kim? Feels like time flies, and here we are 24 years later, I'm still pastoring the same church. By the grace of God. But Timothy was ministering to Mary, the mother of Jesus. Uh, some, of, some of the people that were walking with Jesus at the time when Jesus was, was still on earth. And that must be intimidating as a young pastor in his early 30s. At, they say he was like 30, 35 around there. And it's intimidating when you're preaching in front of people like that. Especially when you're just, getting, you're just kind of green still. That's what I had to do when I first took over this church. And it's been, it's been difficult at times, but the Bible says, be strong in the grace. Say, be strong. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. If we do it in our own strength, we're going to run out of, we're going to run, run out of energy. We're going to run out of zeal. It has to be under the power of the Holy Ghost and also the grace that God's given to each and every one of us. This was written also in the time when persecution was heavy. 
It was not for the faint of heart to be a minister at this time. They were getting persecuted, thrown in prison, beaten. But Timothy had to be strong. Be strong in the grace. In the relationship between Paul and Timothy as a father-son relationship, he cared for Timothy. He mentored Timothy. He encouraged Timothy. He reminded Timothy. He prayed for Timothy. Who are you encouraging today? Who are you praying for today? Every week I'm texting or calling somebody to mentor them, to care for them, and to encourage them. I don't, I don't like to be a discouraging leader. Anyone out there, discouraging types? Always looking for the negative in people's lives. God wants you to take someone, someone alongside of you and say, you know what, I want to encourage you in the faith. I want to build you up in the faith. We have some victory group leaders here that are doing it on a weekly basis. Can I hear an amen from somebody? So we see here in Philippians chapter 2, this is how Paul describes Timothy. It says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus, verse 19 of chapter 2 of of Philippians, trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded, say no one like-minded, who will sincerely care for your state. Not state like, like uh, New York state, state of being, okay? For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proving character. That as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. This type of relationship, it, it's a two-way street. A great discipler needs a great follower. A great leader needs a great follower. And in order for us to grow in, the, in Christ and grow in the grace, we have to be able to be open. So I gave you different spirits, lowercase spirits, last time I spoke to you. And I'm going to go through them real quickly now. You can look at the message two weeks ago to get the full part of this part of the, of the teaching. But not spirit like, you know, like Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit than the other ten spies. This is the type of spirit that Timothy had. Now he had, this is, uh, it's described here in Philippians and also in, in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.14. So a teachable spirit. Say teachable. Are you still teachable? I hope so. Teachable spirit. He also had a kindred spirit. A kindred spirit uh, reflects a family. I like the way Paul describes his, him as a son in the faith. In Victory Outreach, we describe people as spiritual sons and daughters. Even the women, they have called daughters of the house. Come on, daughters. Because we're spiritual sons and daughters. We are descendants. Remember that book? There was a book written about that, I think. And then a sincere spirit. By the way, I sold out my books last week in Bakersfield. I, my hand was hurting. I was, man, I got... Sore hand from signing so many books. And then a sincere spirit. Do we still have sincere people in the house? A caring spirit. Caring for people that are hurting. The, those that are watching online, right now, you may be in the hospital right now. But Victory Outreach, Mother Church cares about you. We love you and we're praying for you. We don't give up on people. A servant spirit. We never stop being servants. My wife told me the other day that she told her brother, her brother gave her, I guess, a cup of coffee or something. This is a while back. And she said, you're such a good servant. <laughs> and he got offended because he wasn't, he's not saved. You know, he doesn't know that, that terminology. He felt like, okay, you're calling me a little slave? What are you? And some, you know, in Christianity, it's not slavery. It's servanthood. We serve people. We serve those above us. We serve those around us. Some of you are so good at serving those above you, but you don't like serving people under you. Uh, am I in the right place? Am I in the right place? As your dad would say, this is my con. By the way, Juliet, where are you, Julie? You little mamacita. Stand up, Julie. 
She's ditching her church for me today. Thank you. This is your real church, though, by the way. Also, a faithful spirit. Now, I look out and I see in this room, I can name name after name after name of faithful servants, faithful people in this room. You never stop coming to church. Even when they blocked the whole 60 freeway, you made it through. I can't stand that. It makes me almost late every time I come to church. Why do they do it on Sunday? Do it on a different day. Anyway. But you're faithful, 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 faithful in your prayers, faithful in your giving, faithful at your post and ministry. And some of you have not been as faithful as they used to be. So this is discipleship. You got to get back on track, get back involved, put your hands to the plow once again. Can I hear a loud amen? amen. Also a proven spirit. Timothy had a proven spirit. You know, he was proven. His character was proven over the years. He was proven. And, and Paul says, I have no one like-minded like him. Then a submissive spirit. That S word, they take it out of the vows now. And I put him back in. You shall submit. Right, Raylene? Submit. <laughs> so Paul could trust Timothy with ministry. Paul put his, his uh, imprint on him. He put his, he says, I endorse this young man. He's going to come to you. He's going to encourage you. He's going to build you up, Philippi. See, we need to be in one mind and one accord as a, as a ministry. From the elders to the regionals to all the pastors to the people in the church, all one mind, one accord, then revival comes. Revival is going to come to our ministry in a strong way. These are, we're in the last days. It's not going to get easier, but God has called us to rise to the occasion to be all we could be for Jesus Christ. Somebody clap your hands if you believe that. So Paul had faced hardships in ministry. At certain times, he was deserted. and other times, he felt lack of support and assistance. But he knew the difficult times and challenges that he faced not only can Ministry be hard, but life itself is filled with challenges. It's filled with challenges. Here Paul charges Timothy to not only be strong, but to commit these things to faithful men. So I'm committing these things to these faithful men in the front. The front row, those that are leaders that you know who you are. I'm committing to them, even with the young adults. We met uh, a couple Fridays ago in that, out, right there in the, in the foyer. It was a great, great thing. If you're a young adult that was there, just clap your hands. We're imparting to the young adults because we believe they're called to take nations. So commit these things, it says. So Paul told him to commit these things to certain types of men. And I want to say women, too, because that's what we're doing on Monday nights with the women. All right? We got one clap from one woman. <laughs> Unless you don't want me to commit these things to you, I don't know. To faithful men who are also able to teach others also. So that's what we do at the D homes, discipleship homes. We select them because we believe they're called to the ministry. We're not just putting them in the house because they can pay rent. No, they feel they're called to the ministry. So they're in a D home, discipleship home, to grow, to learn, to develop. So they had to be strong people that we're looking for, you have to be strong and courageous and intentional in passing it on. What are we passing on? The values and the principles of our faith. The values and the principles, also the biblical doctrine, like we heard Pastor Nick come up here earlier about the doctrine. We need to make sure we're sound in our doctrine. There's a lot of false teaching going on. You can find it on the internet any day of the hour, or any day uh, you can look it up, you're going to find some false teaching there. But if you have sound doctrine and you know your doctrine, you have a good foundation, you're not going to be swayed. So we got to train, we got to develop, and then also instill in, our, in people's lives, just like our mission statement states. So we have a responsibility as men of God and women of God here to uphold, guard, and transmit the truth of the gospel. But you're going to face opposition. In at least three ways you're going to face opposition as a person that's a discipler. Those who are unbelievers, 
will come against you. They're going to face that in Boston as they're out there right now. Those who will twist the message for itchy ears and false doctrine. Hello, somebody. Those that also the devil will himself deceive. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to take you off course. He wants to get you thinking crooked, get you thinking wrong things, get you thinking wicked thoughts. But you got to say, you know what, devil? I'm, you're under my feet. Yeah. Come on now. Clap your hands again. The spiritual warfare that we're engaged in to bring forth God's light in a dark world. There's a lot of warfare going on that we can't see with our physical eyes, but there's unseen things that are warring against us. And the enemy loves to get into your mind. And he gets you so to the place where you get complexed. People, they look, they look at you and you're like, what are you looking at, dude? That happened in Boston. I, I have a story for you. Pastor Danny told me the story. Uh, they were at the subway station and across the path on the other side of the subway, this young man said, he started, he said, what are you, I'm not going to say the words, but what are you looking at, MF-er? <laughs> I guess, you know, some preachers cuss. I, I'm not going to do it. I don't want to be on church milk. Oh my God. <laughs> so what happened was they end up getting on the, on the, on the subway and, and then instead of, what, what, this is what happened. Danny, instead of getting upset that he called him that, he says, Jesus loves you. He loves you. They got in the subway. The guy actually came in and then he said, they asked him, how are you, how are you, how are you doing? He goes, I, I, I'm going to court. I may have to do time. And he broke down in tears because of the love of Jesus. Give the Lord a hand. They're open in Boston. And so there's going to be people coming against you. There's going to be things that will come against you. But you got to stand firm, stand strong in the grace that the Lord has given you. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We're living in a dark world. We fight against an unseen force. But God is for you. God is on your side. Greater is he that's within us than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. You have power, you have authority over the enemy. You can pull down those strongholds in Jesus' name. When you think of a fight, I, like last night's fight, I didn't get to see it because I was studying for you guys. They said it was pretty good. But, you know, we all, a good fight to me is when the underdog wins. I mean, that, to me, it's when the guy that you, you're rooting for that's the underdog, he ends up winning and... I, I gave an illustration a few years, a couple of years ago. Buster Douglas, when he beat Mike Tyson, he got knocked down. I think a couple of times, came back and beat him. But God wants you to go the extra round too. You're not called to quit. You're called to finish, and to finish strong. So what does that mean? We need to endure hardship. Endure hardship. The Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Say soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, say athletics. He is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer, say hard-working farmer, must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. So endure hardship as a good soldier. See, a soldier commits his life to his country 
for the good and protection of the people and for the freedom of the people. How many veterans do we have in this place right now? Lift your hand. See, once you enlisted, give them, give them a hand, the ones that raise your hand. You know, I, I was watching the news the other day, and there's, it's a tragedy that a lot of veterans are committing suicide. It's just, it's not even in my notes, but I, we got to pray for our veterans. And a lot of them are addicted to different vices, and, and they're hurting. They're hurting people because they have a lot of, maybe they, they, they came back and they had trauma and, and is it post-traumatic stress syndrome? Is that what they call that? And they end up going into a place of darkness and they do things to harm themselves. So let's keep that in prayer. And a soldier, you're either enlisting or you're getting drafted. In times of war, you get drafted. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I was drafted into the army of God. <laughs> I wasn't looking for it, man. I, I, I didn't want to be a, a minister. I, it was the last thing on my mind. But when God gets a hold of you and he puts a calling upon you, you can't leave this war. You stay in the battle till the end. Soldier for life. Some of you need to soldier up today. Don't engage yourself with the world's affairs, but get plugged in to what God wants you to do in the ministry. If you're willing to fight for your country, how about fighting for the kingdom? So Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, it says, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan into flame, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit that God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Imagine that. Join with me in suffering by the power of God. I mean, that doesn't sound appealing. We want to be blessed. But I want to tell you, ministry is not always fun. It's challenging at times. Because people are challenging. All right. That Depeche Mode song always comes up to me when I talk about people. People are people, so why should it be? You and I should get along. I forgot the rest. So people, my college professor, when I was in Bible college, one of the ladies, she said, there's two things wrong with ministry, Sundays and people. <laughs> wow, that sounds appealing, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, people produce problems. And sometimes ministry is not easy, and it's not all, it's not all clean. It gets dirty sometimes. Then you, but the thing is, we've got to be people to reconcile them back to God. You don't condemn people when they make mistakes. You help them up. You show mercy. You show mercy to people that fail. You show mercy to people that fall. You pick them up and say, we're going to get back on track. You're called to be a soldier. You're called to be a man of God. You're called to be a son in the faith. You're called to be a daughter in the faith. We don't give up on people. I've seen my dad over and over and over forgiving people that have come and gone, come and gone. And when I was a kid, I didn't get it. I didn't like it. I knew what they would say about him. I knew they talked behind his back. This is before social media. And I said, I can't stand these people. Some of you, no. <laughs> but he would forgive over and over. And I was like, how could you do that? And then I thought, when I got saved, I realized that's Jesus style. Jesus forgives. Jesus forgave us. He forgives you. You sinned this week. I know you did. And you're here forgiven today. Because you confessed your sins. Give the Lord a hand that he forgives you. But I'm here to also tell you, fan into flame your gifts of the Spirit. 
We're all born with talents, but also we have gifts that were given by the Holy Spirit when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Some of you have the gift of speaking in tongues. Some of you have interpretation gifts. Some of you have the gifts of healings. Some of you have the gifts of faith. Some of you have a gift of leadership. Some of you have a gift of teaching, but you're sitting on it and you're not fanning it into flame and it's dormant. You're not being the soldier that you're called to be. Man, it got quiet on that part. A soldier in the army of God never gives in, never gives up. They stay focused. They stay fit. They stay purposeful. They exercise their giftings for the kingdom of God. So I'm encouraging you today, stir it up. Stir it up. Just do this. Stir it up. Why don't we do this? Fan it. Fan the flame that's in you. Fan the person next to you. They probably like that. It's air conditioned. Thank you. Paul tells Timothy, don't get caught up in civilian affairs. Everything in this earth is temporal, guys and girls. Don't get caught up in that. Oh, I got to make money so I can't go to church every Sunday. I got to do this. No, you're getting caught up. God, it's either you're serving God or mammon. Someone that prepared to fight was David. He fought in the shepherd's field. He fought for those sheep. He fought the lion. He fought the bear. But then, he, then they would call, when he went to the, to, the, to the fight against the Philistines, he had his first public fight. So you fight your private fights, but then God calls you out into the public to be able to win the victory for others. He practiced alone repeatedly. You got to practice in your prayer closet. You got to get alone with God, get that strength you need. Then when you come out of that prayer room, you come out refreshed. You come out with a sense of, of victory and dignity and self-respect. You're, you're able to have confidence that only God could give you. When you have the God confidence, then you're able to fight any warfare and you're able to overcome any problems that may come your way. And then you're able to help others as well. So now he also uses the illustration of an athlete. An athlete trains hard for his sport. They train hard, they practice a lot, they review the plays, they meditate on the wins, but also they practice to get better every single time they get on that field. If you watch the Dodge, for instance, or they have those iPads in the dugout. After they have their bat, they go in the dugout, they look it up, make sure they want to review their swings, they review the pitches, they review everything because they want to get better for the next at bat. When I was an athlete, which I'm not anymore, as much as I used to be, <laughs> I would stay after practice. I would run more than the other pitchers would run. I would condition more, I would practice more because I wanted to be the best. Every year, I would make all-stars. I would miss vacations with my family. My parents would always go on vacation with the family, and I would stay back because I didn't want to miss the all-stars. I was committed to it. How are you today? Where's your commitment? I was so upset yesterday, I went to my son's game. <sighs> Tyler and Cody, and they were on the bench. I was like, what the heck? Cody's really good. Tyler is too. Tyler's more of a football player now. But I'm like, I, I, how could you not have one of the Arkansas on the field? <laughs> Just one at least. So Cody didn't even get a chance to bat. I was like, I, when I left, I would say, hey, Cody, how did you do it? You, you got, did you get a hit? He goes, Dad, I, never, I didn't get a chance. I did it on, on purpose out loud so the coach could hear I didn't get a chance to get, Dad. And so I walked away angrily. <laughs> but when you're an athlete, you, you, you run the race with endurance. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, 
It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, watch, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. God wants us to finish this race. We're running for incorruptible crown. There's a crown awaiting every single saint in this room. Now you may not be a, always on target. You, you, may, you may make some mistakes, but you're still a child of God. And God says you never give up. Paul says keep on running the race. Don't beat the air. Don't run with uncertainty. Run knowing that you're running for a cause. Running for a call that God has given you. Put, he has a calling upon your life. Don't forfeit the call on your life. Souls are hanging in the balance and some of you are sitting on it. God says, rise up and be the best man you could be. Flee youthful lust. Woo. There's a lot of lust going around. Man, it got quiet. Remember that message I spoke to you about? Temptation. Right? Lust is the root of sinful life. Mm. Let me check your phone after this. <laughs> I, I let my wife look at my phone. She's not, she doesn't worry about me, but I, I say, check, can you check my text for me? Check, check the, I'm, she knows my code. I don't care. I have nothing to hide there. Hello. It's getting quiet again. She's looking at stuff that's ridiculous these days, though. I'm telling you. <laughs> Last week at Bakersfield, I'm getting ready to preach in the morning, and she's looking at baby videos that make her laugh. <laughs> that's her sin right there. Instead of praying for me, she's looking at dumb videos. Okay. She did pray for me. Though. But she's getting that feeling, I want to be a grandma. I'm like, what? She's feeling an empty nest. We already have two kids that are out of the house now. I go, they're not even married yet. Cruz, don't do anything yet. Hold up, brother. Hold up. I don't want to be a good grandpa too soon. Okay. So, are you focused or are you distracted? When you run this race, you run knowing that you're running for the finish line. You don't stop. You keep that stride going. It's not a sprint to the finish line. It's a marathon all the way to the end. Can I hear a loud amen? And lastly, hardworking farmer. I know we have a lot of hardworking people in this room. I could name names in this room that I know you work very hard, but God's going to reward you for your service. And also those that work hard in the ministry as well. You know, my parents, I think, are the hardest workers in the ministry. They travel, they preach, they teach, they disciple, they do leadership stuff all over the world. They do Zooms almost on a, almost on a daily basis with certain people around the country. But God has called us to be a hardworking farmer, too, in the kingdom of God. See, a hardworking farmer goes to work expecting a harvest. He knows when to break hardened ground. He knows when to till. He knows when to sow seed. He knows when to water it. And then after they water it, they wait. They know that it's going to produce a harvest, a crop. He watches and waits diligently for the harvest to come. As a V-group leader... You may be toiling in that group. You may be losing people, keeping people. Sometimes you do good, sometimes you don't do that good. And you're thinking, man, is this in vain? I'm here to tell you, if you do it unto the Lord, it's not in vain. You just keep on pouring yourself out. Keep on giving yourself to those people because they need you. We need each other. We need to build each other up. We need some more Pauls to rise up. 
We need some more Timothys to stand up and be a learner, a teachable person with a kindred spirit. Matthew chapter 13, 18. Are you still with me? Okay, I'm coming to a close, okay? 13, 18, it says, Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. You should underline underline that part if you have a Bible. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of his life and deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil, this is what you want to have, your heart, okay, refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. I'm hoping that I'm delivering seeds to you that won't fail, that won't fall on hard ground, that won't go into thorny ground, that will fall on good soil, that your heart will be open and teachable. And to take the hit, if, if you feel exhorted, Take it. Feel corrected? Take it. If you feel rebuked, take it. If I'm, if I'm going to be a, a, a serving you, i got to serve you the real meal here. That means the stuff that some kids don't like, like the vegetables. They eat everything but the vegetables. And the vegetables sometimes don't taste good at first, but they make you healthy. I got one clap. I got two clap. They make you healthy. I look at my son Cody, he just loves Reese's peanut butter cups. Take me to 7-Eleven, Dad. And then he doesn't eat healthy. He's real skinny, though. I mean, God. But then he's tired a lot. I think, we need some more vitamins or something. But some of you, your diet is not complete, spiritually speaking. You're not working out like you used to. You're not putting in the time like you used to. And you know it too. You feel weak. You feel kind of like a reed. When the wind blows, you blow with it. And then you get bitter. You get angry. You snap a lot at people. Because you're not taking time with the Lord. See, with the word comes joy. The joy of the Lord is your strength. When I get cranky, my wife knows I didn't pray yet. I'll be honest with you. I'll be talking nice to someone on the phone, like my assistant, Raylene, maybe, and then all of a sudden I hang up, she asks me a question, and boom, I get, I blow off. And she goes, how come you're so nice to everyone else but me? Woo! Confessions. Come on, man. I know you're the same way. Come on. Don't, don't be a liar. You're nice to all the employees, you're nice to the people, your bosses, you're nice, 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 but when it comes to your spouse, (laughs) you're mean. Because you're not letting the word get in you. The joy of the Lord, the spirit of of peace, of love, the spirit, the, the, the fruit of the spirit I'm talking about. Love, joy, peace, long suffering. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, joy, all these things, self-control, all these things are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But if you're not studying the word, you're not letting the word be applied to you, then it's falling on thorny ground and it's not taking residence in your heart. See, there's people that know how to quote the word, they know how to underline the word or highlight the word, but they're not living the word. There's people in the streets that may know more of the word than you do, but they're hooked on drugs. They're hooked on something. And they could talk circles around you because they have a knowledge of the word, but it's not in their heart. They're not living it out. Their character is poor. You see, if you want a great calling, you've got to have great character. A heavyweight calling 
calls for a heavyweight character. I heard it once said that if you have a heavy calling, heavyweight call, but a lightweight character, you're going to get crushed in the end. But I believe we're raising up champions in this room. We're raising up victory people in this room because we're victory outreach. We're not defeated outreach. We're called to win. We're called to be temperate. We're called to call all the way for God. We're called to continue the race and never quit, to fight the good fight of faith, to press toward that mark that God has for each and every one in this room. We have a call to grow this church, to build it, to double in size within, a, within the next few months. We want to double in size by the new year, possibly start double services in the new year. God has called us, Victory Outreach Mother Church, to be senders to the, to the foreign land, to raise up money for Run for Hope, to also raise money for our building, also to raise money for our homes, also to raise money to build our next building, the future. God has called you and I to tear it up. Come on, stand to your feet if you're not standing already. Clap your hands. We are Victory Outreach. But some of you today, you may find yourself in defeat. You may find yourself even feeling convicted right now as I speak. And they always say, when you, as a preacher, you're always preaching to yourself before you preach to the people. And I, when I prepare these messages, I look at myself, I say, I gotta improve some areas too. And I'm very transparent with all of you. You know, in my private life, I tell you about my wife, I tell you about my kids, I tell, they don't like it, but I do it anyway. God wants to raise you up to break the curse in your family and to raise up your future descendants. If you want to come to the altar, I'm here to pray for you. As they sing this chorus, come on down. We want to pray with you. things came to mind one thing is people that are looking at bad stuff on the internet that's it's become an epidemic in society as a whole not just men women too one pastor told me that he did a study that women look at stuff more than men 
So it's, that can't be in, in the house of God. You gotta clean it up. That's why you're frustrated sometimes because you're looking at stuff that's getting you all messed up, corrupted in your brain. That's what merit, and the next thing I wanna pray for is marriages because it messes up marriages too. So we're gonna pray right now for those two things to be broken and the marriages to be strengthened, okay? We're gonna pray right now against that. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if that's you because it is embarrassing if that is you, especially in the house of God, but you could break it today. You could break it today. You don't wanna be that person that's all these different junks in your mind. Your mindset is all jacked up because you're watching stuff that you shouldn't be watching. Can we pray for that right now? Okay, I'm gonna pray for that. And then marriage is next. Okay, let's pray for both. Lord Jesus, I come before you right now. I pray for those that are struggling with watching wrong things on the internet or watching wrong types of footage or movies, whatever it may be. We wanna break it in the name of Jesus. We wanna break it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, let purity come in pureness of heart, purity of heart. Lord, I pray right now that you would deliver those that are struggling with that, that area in their life. Break that stronghold in Jesus' name. We pull down that stronghold. We cast every argument against, every thought against God. We pull it down in Jesus' name. And purify the minds of every young person, every older person, every person in this room are those that are watching on, online, God purify our minds and help us to have self-control over what we watch and what we look at in the name of Jesus now we're going to pray for the marriages if you're married just raise your hands right now if you're with your spouse get close to her if, if she's not around you that's okay because the devil wants to he wants to break up marriages he wants you to be divided I can't sleep at night if I get into an argument with my wife. I gotta make up, she can go to sleep. I, I'm not that type. I know, we just gotta make up, let's make up. Cause I'm not gonna, I, I'm never gonna break away from this woman. By the grace of God, we're in it for life. And your marriage, you gotta make a commitment. First to God and then to each other. Recommit yourself to your wife. Recommit yourself to your husband. Make it right. Make it good. Wives, submit to your husbands, but husbands, love your wife. You gotta love her like Jesus loved us. He gave himself up for us. When you love your wife, oh man, you're gonna get some good cooking. Woo! With a smile. I got two cooks now in the house. My mother-in-law and Sister Kim. And they switch off with the dishes and all that. So my wife's kind of happy about that. Hey, man. But I got to put my pants on before I go in the kitchen. <laughs> Am I real or real? Well, yeah, I'm real. <laughs> hey. Happy wife, happier life. Am I being good lately, Kim? Yeah, okay, all right. I wouldn't be able to preach this or say this unless I'm doing better in this area. But we all have our ups and downs. We have our valleys. But you never give up. That's your wife. And she's your life. And that's your husband. And he's your only one you're going to have going forward. That's it. You want to stick with that man. Stick with that woman. Make it work. Make it last. And then you can be that Paul to your children. You can be that leader for your family. That patriarch. That, that legacy. That book that I wrote, Descendants. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> You're called to have your descendants too. 
physically and spiritually. So let's raise our hands, wives and husbands. Or hold hands of your wife, you have her with you. Kim, come up here for this part. Come up here. God just led me on this area. It wasn't in my notes. This is how the Holy Spirit works, okay? I always follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray for reconciliation, healing in marriages. You know, when it's not right at home, it overflows into every area of your life. But we're going to believe God that he's going to bring healing, deep healing, trust. There's going to be mending of hearts. In Jesus' name, Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. We know that you, God, you are the creator of marriage. You are the one, God, who ordained marriage. And we pray, God, that you would bring unity in the household, unity in the marriage. We pray, God, for reconciliation, deep healing to take place. We pray, God, for forgiveness to take place. We pray, God, for a new spirit, a new heart, God. We pray that you refresh, renew marriages in the name of Jesus. We pray, God, for bondages to be broken in the name of Jesus. We pray for purity, God purity in the marriage bed. We pray, God, that you would just renew and restore households. We pray that you would establish, God, within our households, God, a legacy of faith, God, a legacy of purity, a legacy, God, for our children to follow in. We want to see strong families in this house, in your house, God, in the house of God. We want to see strong families, strong marriages. We're willing to fight for it, God. Give us the strength, God. Give us, God, the resolve to build in accordance of your word, God. Holy Spirit, continue to work within the lives of couples, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. And now I want to pray for the singles now. Okay? Some of you singles are wanting to hook up. She says, I am. <laughs> like Philip said, he made this up, let's line up. You got to look up for your hookup. <laughs> right? I think that was yours, right? Or was that me? I stole it from you then. Look up for your hookup. Instead of hooking up before you look up. When you pray, listen to me, singles. When you're, when you're in alignment with the Holy Spirit and God, God will bring that person and merge that person into your lane at the right time. You don't have to be searching for it. You don't have to be on matchmaking.com or whatever they have. I don't even know what they have these days. <laughs> she said match.com. <laughs> and then for the, for, the, for the elderly ones that are you feeling lonely out there? You're never alone because God is with you. Yeah, there it is right there. <laughs> Thank you. I just, we just have to Google eyes right now. God brought her right on time for me. I waited. I got the best partner that I could ask for. So I'm gonna, singles, raise your hands right now. If you're next to another single, I want you to just make this vow to the Lord. You're gonna keep it pure until the time's right. You hear me? Until the vows are spoken, you're gonna keep your life pure. Amen? All right, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for all the singles in the room. Those that are viewing online, I pray that you would protect our minds, protect their hearts. I pray that you would keep them pure, pure in mind, pure in heart, that they'll wait on your direction, on your guidance for the mate that they, that they desire to have eventually. I pray that you keep them strong in you, God, that they will not divert to the right or to the left and do the wrong thing. I pray you take away any desperations in their heart. Anything that's crowding their heart, God. 
And I pray that they would put you on the pedestal of their heart and build a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.